Hello everyone, welcome to this GMF on Turkey conversation. Uh, my name is Kadri Taştan, I'm TOBB Senior Fellow with the German Marshall Fund here in Brussels. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is actually the fifth session of the GMF Turkey conversation since the outbreak of the COVID-19. And even now, if under this pandemic, it's difficult to get attention to almost anything but this crisis, we are trying to come together virtually to discuss some of the most important issues concerning Turkey and other issues. Today's focus will be on Turkey-Russia relations. So for, more, for almost 10 years, if you put aside a crisis period of eight or nine months, when the Russian aircraft was shut down by Turkey, Ankara and Moscow have chosen to compartmentalize their dialogue, minimizing conflicting files and ostensibly displaying their agreement. This relation has developed in recent years, especially since the attempted coup d'etat, the deterioration of Turkish relations with the West and the direct engagement of Russia in Syrian conflict. But the recent tension between Ankara and Moscow in Idlib in Syria has revived doubt about the political relation between Turkey and Russia. So obviously here uh, there are a lot to discuss and for this we have an excellent panel today. Uh, let me uh, first introduce them. Uh, our first speaker is General Ben Hoges. He's a former commanding general of US Army in Europe and he's currently Pershing Chair at the Center uh, for European Policy Analysis. Thank you, General, for joining. And our second speaker is uh, Professor Mustafa Aydın. He's a Professor of International Relation at the, Relations at the Kadir Haas University. Thank you, Professor Aydın, for joining. And our third speaker is my colleague, Alina Inaye. Uh, she's the Director of Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation at GMF Bucharest. Thank you, Alina, for joining. First of all, as moderator, I will ask some questions to our speakers and have some conversation with them. And then we will go, uh, we'll open up, of course, to all of you. Just to say that this is on the record. And if you uh, would, if you would like to put your a question, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. And we will keep track of your question and we will get as many of you as we can. Uh, please, when you are asking also your question, just specify uh, uh, to whom you are asking your question. With this, I would like to start uh, our first round to, to maybe to focus a bit on the historical aspect of this relation. And uh, Professor Aydan, I, I would like to start with you here. We know that the Russian, uh, Turkey-Russia relation have a long history. Uh, can you provide us a bit, a briefly historical perspective of this relation and its main characteristic in two, three minutes, please. Over to you. Okay. Um, thank you, Kadri. Uh, it's nice to be here and nice to see friendly faces. Uh, yes, it's a long history and it's uh, it, both the Turks and the Russians have long memories and they have not forgotten what has uh, happened in history. Uh, when you look at the history, a couple of um, phrases come to the mind, you know, geopolitical competition, historical hostility, uh, territorial contraction, existential threats, and etc. So these are kind of uh, catchphrases that comes to my mind, at least, when I look and read the Turkish-Russian history. Uh, at least since the 17th century, that was, uh, relationship was defined in terms of a Russian attempt to move towards uh, west and south, and wrote Ottoman attempt to block uh, Russia on both accounts. And especially after the, when we came to the 18th century, the struggle war about, was about uh, mostly Balkans and the Straits, who was going to control the Straits. Uh, and of course, uh, the Black Sea was uh, part of the competition even before that. Uh, however, uh, you know, from the Ottoman Turkish perspective, the relations with Russians were always related to warfare, uh, conflict, and also territorial losses. That kind of a long memory is passed on, was passed on to the Turkish state. Uh, nevertheless, in the 20th century, we have seen a couple of periods where uh, the two states uh, collaborated with each other. And I'll come back to that, but uh, the defining um, characteristic of the 20th century was, of course, 
uh, especially after the Second World War, was Turkey's uh, defensive position against its northern uh, uh, global nuclear uh, neighbor, uh, which it felt uh, almost constantly it felt under threat. Uh, that was the same threat that pushed Turkey at the end of the Second World War uh, towards joining the Western uh, alliance system, and it kept it there. And actually, from the, of course, from the Western perspective, especially from the U.S. perspective, the value of Turkey was uh, its role in the containment policy of Soviet Union throughout the uh, 20th century. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, when Soviet Union felt that it needed to ask uh, joint control of the Straits, that was the defining moment of the relationship in the 20th century. But as I said, um, and I'll finish with this, is there were a couple of periods where Turkey and Russia collaborated. And in, in both periods, uh, the defining characteristic is that both states has difficult relationship with the West. Of course, Soviet Union always had difficult relations throughout the 20th century uh, with the West. But in the, in the moments when Turkey had problems, it always uh, tried to use uh, Russia or Soviet Union at the time as a counterbalance uh, to the West. So one example was in 1920s and 1930s, where both countries were feeling vulnerable from the Western attacks or Western pressure, and they cooperated with each other. Uh, and the second period is uh, mid-1960s to uh, mid-1970s, where Turkey, during which Turkey had a problematic relationship with, uh, uh, with the West, with the United States in general, and looked for Soviet Union uh, for military and economic aid, mostly economic aid. And as a result, uh, we have seen that Turkey was uh, the biggest development aid receiver uh, from the Soviet Union during the Cold War, apart from the uh, Eastern Bloc countries. So uh, we have seen ups and downs, but the defining characteristics are two. One, competition and, and, and wariness against the Soviet Union. Uh, and the second is moments of cooperation when Turkey felt vulnerable vis-a-vis uh, -vis West. So let me stop here. Thank you, Professor Aydin. Thank you for this. Uh, General Hooch, if you let me, I, will, I would like to continue with you. Let's st stay in this uh, historical aspect of relation. What was Turkey's role in NATO vis-a-vis -vis the U Soviet Union dur during the Cold War? How satisfactorily did Turkey play this role? Over to you. Thanks, uh, Kadri. And for sure, uh, I echo what uh, Professor Aydin uh, has said. Um, of course, Turkey's role uh, inside the alliance, which it has performed extremely well for uh, almost seven decades, uh, was part, a critical part of containment um, of the Black Sea Fleet. Uh, specifically because of Turkish sovereignty over the Straits uh, as part of a series, if you will, um, the Straits and then the Aegean Islands and then the island of Crete are all part of NATO's efforts to contain Soviet aggression. And Turkey did this extremely well, played its part extremely well. It also, of course, was home for thousands uh, of American soldiers uh, and uh, airmen in, in several bases throughout Turkey. Uh, and of course, uh, Turkey has provided uh, a headquarters in Izmir for NATO uh, since 1952, since Turkey joined the alliance, longer than any other uh, headquarters in all of NATO, except for the headquarters in Naples. So it's been a, uh, a long time uh, reliable ally, and not to mention the fact that Turkish armed forces have always been uh, very effective and capable, and uh, Turkish officers um, have filled so many positions in Alliance headquarters. Even Minister Akar um, uh, served when he was a, an officer, served in NATO headquarters. So that's the quality uh, that we've come to expect of uh, Turkish officers serving in headquarters. The original framework of the, of the relationship, of course, was based on containment. Uh, what I would call, uh, uh, in fact, what my friend Ozgur uh, uh, came up with this, you know, this is uh, Turkey USA or Turkey NATO 1.0. Military focus, uh, Turkey at the bottom right-hand corner of most NATO maps, along with the Black Sea, um, and 
the boundary between U.S. European Command and U.S. Central Command also being the boundary between Turkey and Syria, which has had some unintended negative consequences causing uh, uh, Turkey's role to be not, not appreciated, if you will, vis-a-vis -vis the Central Command area because you have two different headquarters on that boundary. And so for sure, it's time to reinvent this framework, a, a Turkey USA 2.0, uh, where Turkey and the Black Sea are in the middle of the map, not on the bottom right-hand corner of the map. Thank you, General Hoches. Uh, Inay, it's part on uh, uh, Alina. Uh, look, looking from a historical perspective, what is Russia's, Russia's uh, regional perspective? How do they try to achieve this? Throughout the history, Russia has seen this, uh, this region as its own uh, sphere of influence, a region which should stay in its own uh, sphere of influence and has seen the Black Sea as a Russian lake. We do have a saying across the region that, you know, Black Sea is, is a Russian lake. And they have been trying to achieve this again throughout the history, but especially so in the 20th century and now in the 21st century through two things, two, two, uh, two uh, directions. Uh, first of all, protecting power in the region, and second, exerting influence in the region. In the 20th century, uh, after, the, after the Second War, projecting power was about um, projecting the military might of, of, of Russia without um, entering into direct conflict or open conflict, but just projecting the, 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 uh, um, the strength of the military army on, and of its uh, military arsenal. Um, exerting influence was very much done through uh, spreading the communist ideology throughout the region, through through the through the propaganda machine of the of the of the Russian Communist Party. This has changed in the 21st century. This has changed with 2008 and especially in 2000, 2014, when Russia has started open direct conflicts in the region, starting with Georgia and then continuing with uh, with Crimea. Um, Russia doesn't now currently doesn't only project power. Russia is a massive military a military arsenal in Crimea and uh, and in, uh, throughout the region. Um, and Russia, as I said, engaged in uh, uh, engages in direct conflicts, in open conflicts. It continues to try. It continues to succeed, actually, to exert influence throughout the region, uh, both through its propaganda and its disinformation uh, disinformation you know, machine. Yeah, yeah. If I may, the... yeah. Let's, tr if you want, try to stay in the historical perspective because in the second okay. round, we come to the, really today and I want to go step by step if you want. Okay, so then let me, let me, let me end at the, at the 20th, 20th century sure. uh, before, before everything started uh, to look the way it looks now. And just to say that Russia has only seen not the region, not the land, not the countries in the region, but also the Black Sea, as I said, as its internal lake, as its direct lake. Hence, the, the, the placing of, uh, of the Black Sea fleet in uh, um, one of its imp most important fleets in, um, in, this, uh, in this sea. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about the propaganda machine, which did function very, very well throughout the 20th century, right. um, and uh, which did keep all of the countries around in the region, uh, with the exception of Turkey, um, in, the, in the ideological communist uh, sphere. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I will, okay. now we are going to the second round. I wanted to really go to today and uh, coming to today and to see a bit the current relations. Uh, Professor Aydin, I would like to continue with you here. How would you define the uh, Turkey-Russia relationship today? What are the driver of Turkish-Russian rapprochement, rapprochement? And do you think Turkey and Russia are strategically compatible? You should unmute, uh, Professor. Okay, sorry. Um, well, rapprochement, of course, started in uh, late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, when you look at it, the first uh, input was, I would say, the lessening of geopolitical competition over Eurasia, which defined the relationship in 1990s. You know, when Soviet Union collapsed, Turkey enthusiastically joined the fray uh, to create an influence relationship, uh, influence area in Eurasia, especially in the, in the Caucasus and Central Asia. And also Turkish uh, instigated 
movement of Black Sea economic cooperation uh, and also increased Turkish uh, naval presence in the Black Sea uh, allowed Turkey to play this competition. Uh, and that was mostly uh, in 1990s and during this period, of course, Turkey was supported by the United States in this endeavor. And part of this competition, actually large part of this competition was about the energy security and who is going to host uh, the pipelines from the Caspian region. But at the end of the 1990s, we have seen that two countries, both Russia and Turkey, uh, have realized their uh, uh, their ambition of having a pipeline from the, from the region. Uh, a a Baku-Novorossiysk pipeline, uh, uh, sorry, tengiz Novorossiysk pipeline in the Russian case and baku tiflisi Jehan pipeline in the Turkish case uh, lessened this competition or the reason for this competition. Uh, then came a, a, a period uh, of uh, a problematic or triangle. Uh, uh, United States started to appear in the in the region after 9-11 events, more, uh, more increasingly. Uh, and this, of course, sidelined in a way, it was not maybe the intention, but this is unintentional consequences. It sidelined Turkey in the Caucasus and Central Asia. And Russia uh, became uh, in a uh, locked in a competition with the United States over this region. Uh, this, of course, also kind of declined the intensity of competition between Turkey and Russia. And also it's increased from the Turkish perspective uh, of an understanding that uh, whether Turkey is uh, happy to have non-Black Sea uh, countries in the region, that how it was formulated. And it, Turkey came to a conclusion that cooperating with Russia uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the Caucasus and the Black Sea might be more beneficial for Turkish interests than competition with Russia. And then, of course, it started from that kind of a premises, uh, the economic relationship started to grow, and that was the real bedrock of the, of the rapprochement. And as a result, when we come uh, in, in 2010s, the trade between two countries reached over $30 billion. Uh, the construction business uh, reached about 65, 70 million uh, dollars completed construction by 2017. Uh, tourism is like four and a half million Russians every year coming to Turkey. And investment in both countries, you know, Turkish investment in Russia is about 10 billion uh, and comparable amount is invested in Turkey by Russia. So this is a very strong uh, incentive for the leaders, political leaders to invest their, uh, their capital. Uh, but apart from that, we have an energy cooperation uh, you know, even before that, we had energy competition between Russia and Turkey. Uh, Turkey started to buying na Russian natural gas in 1987, before the end of the Cold War. And now, when we come today, we have three pipelines operating under the Black Sea, directly linking two countries. And of course, added to this is now the Russian investment in Turkey to build a uh, uh, Akkuyu uh, nuclear power plant. So this is a also a very strong incentive for the continuation of, of the rapprochement, at least. Uh, uh, and finally, is uh, I think what really tipped the point in after 2010 onwards uh, was and still is the Syrian case. Uh, the changing perception of Turkey uh, regarding the United States position in the Middle East uh, and also uh, increasing distancing of Turkey from the West in general. This was, of course, not only the United States, but it was coupled, the timing also coupled with Turkey's um, kind of enslavement uh, with the European Union as well. The relationship has been put on hold uh, since 2005, uh, and that kind of created a background. And when the United States uh, become involved uh, in Syria, especially with the Kurds, that triggered uh, Turkey's age-old uh, historical fear uh, of dismemberment. And then Russia became a kind of an ally for Turkey to balance United States in the region. And I think this is a kind of a, a picture at the moment. Uh, whether they are compatible geopolitically, it's an interesting question. I, I believe personally that they are, even though they are cooperating and their cooperation have increased, I still do believe that they are 
uh, in a competition geopolitically because the region, the, the geography forces two countries to have, a, 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 to have this competition because they are also uh, very ambitious countries. Both Turkey and Russia in this neighborhood are very ambitious, even though now Turkey is struggling with several different problems and have to kind of scale back some of its ambitions, it doesn't mean that we have forgotten or Turkey have forgotten all those ambitions. Uh, and uh, recent examples in extension of uh, uh, the Mediterranean theater into Libya, for example. So when you look at different um, geographies that two countries come uh, face to face, uh, there is always competition, even in the Syrian theater. Even if when we are cooperating very closely in Syrian theater, uh, it, when you watch the Syrian theater, there is a kind of a game of chess playing. You know, one country moves one uh, um, uh, chess piece to one side and the other responds. So there is always this, what I would call competitive cooperation or cooperative competition. Thank you. Thank you for this, Professor Aydın. General Hochschild, I would like to continue with you here in this uh, session. Uh, can you evaluate the, the Turkish-Russian rapprochement from a transatlantic perspective? What does this mean for NATO and uh, Turkey's position uh, within NATO? So, um, I don't know if I would characterize it as rapprochement, as more of, it's more of a continuation of an uneasy relationship between two large, important, powerful, uh, Black Sea neighbors. Uh, and frankly, it's, to me, it seems completely normal that Turkey would uh, look for uh, ways to do business uh, with Russia. They have, they have to live across the Black Sea from Russia. So this, this is normal. And the fact that they, uh, Turkey gets energy, for example, to me, this is normal. The tourism, the construction, all of these things seem like uh, normal. Uh, Norway, on the other side of NATO, of course, uh, has maintained for decades since it joined NATO, uh, has had to cooperate with its Russian neighbor, just like everybody else does. And even when I was still in the army and we would do exercises in Poland, the gas, the fuel that we were using for our vehicles was fuel that had been imported from Russia into Poland. So uh, just because Turkey is an important part of NATO doesn't mean that uh, I would expect Turkey not to have uh, different types of, uh, of a normal relationship with Russia. The problem is uh, Russia's behavior, particularly in Syria, uh, ha they have, uh, and I think very deliberately, weaponized refugees. Uh, Russian support for uh, the Assad regime has sent more than 3 million refugees into Turkey. And Turkey has had to carry this burden almost alone for several years now. Uh, President Putin could stop this immediately by putting the appropriate pressure on the Assad regime. But of course, they have no interest in doing that. So I don't know how Turkey uh, and Russia can be, could be considered in some sort of rapprochement. And then, of course, dozens of Turkish soldiers killed by a Russian airstrike in Syria while the S-400 sits in boxes back in Turkey. So there, this is a very problematic relationship. What does this mean for Tur Turkey's position in NATO? Look, the alliance is so much better with Turkey than without Turkey. Despite the challenges, despite the friction, Turkey sits in such an important place. It provides such important capabilities to the alliance. Uh, we are better having Turkey in the alliance. The problem is that we don't have a strategy. We, the West, we, NATO, we, the United States, don't have a strategy for the Black Sea region. If you look at a map with the Black Sea in the middle, instead of down on the corner, and you look out the outer ring, it becomes immediately apparent how important Turkey is for the containment of Iran, for the deterrence of Russia, uh, to provide, uh, help provide stability in the Balkan region. Uh, this, is, this is the important strategic role that Turkey can play. We just have to come up with a strategy. Now, um, if not, if not for NATO, I would imagine that Turkey and Greece would have been in two or three different conflicts now, other than Cyprus. So the alliance is important for Turkey, and Turkey has to want to be an important part of this as well. The S-400 deal, this is a symptom um, of uh, Turkey not having confidence in the West, as well as, as, well as uh, domestic concerns about security of the, of the president. 
it has nothing to do with uh, a budding romance between Turkey and Russia. Thank you. Thank you, General. I was just Alina, uh, you, you can, uh, of course, follow up uh, with your analysis in the, of uh, the first session, but here I have another question for you too. How do, you, how do the regional countries see the Turkey-Russia rapprochement? How do they adjust? I wouldn't characterize it as a rapprochement either. It's an on and off relation. And I think that countries in the region, as everybody else, uh, um, have understood that it's an on and off um, transactional relation, as it should be, and as um, the countries themselves have um, uh, with, with other actors. Um, there are three stages of, of this relation and of Turkey's involvement in the region, because this is an important part of the conversation. Um, which the countries in the region have witnessed and they've had different feelings uh, towards this. First of all, before 1990, everything was clear. The, the world order was much clearer than it is today. Uh, and uh, the, the roles in the region, around the region were very clear as well. After 1990, Turkey has become very interested in the Black Sea region, very active in the Black Sea region. DSEC has been you know, set up and, and, and uh, placed in Istanbul. Um, and for about 20 years until 2008, Turkey has played a very active role in the region with initiatives, with ideas, uh, with regional initiatives and ideas, I wanna say. Everything, of course, changed in 2008 with the NATO summit in Bucharest, um, after which Russia decided to change its role in the region and to become aggressive, uh, militarily aggressive. And then two years later, Turkey has started withdrawing from the region because it's a, withdrawing its attention from the region because its attention moved southwards towards towards middle east towards syria towards towards the the, the the conflict there and its and its southern border so the countries in the region have witnessed the on and off relation as i said after 2008 after russia became aggressive initially with very much concern um thinking that when russia and turkey had a good relation when they were close with each other when they seemed to cooperate that this is going to mean uh, into even more aggression in the region, into an even more uh, aggressive Russia in the region, new hot conflicts, new, uh, new territories to be annexed, and so on and so forth. But as I said, it was very soon understood that it's a trans transactional relationship, it's on and off. It doesn't lead to Russia being more aggressive in the region. Um, and, and now what I witness, my analysis is that Countries in the region are much more, are much less focused on the relation between Turkey and Russia. And Turkey, as I said, has become a minor player in the region. It has maintained its role in NATO uh, when it comes to the Black Sea region, but otherwise politically it, it has very much withdrawn. Um, and countries in the region have started looking more at NATO, at the EU and at the US as important players in the region, rather than worrying, being concerned, and being consumed with a, with a, uh, with a Russia-Turkey Turkey relation. Thank you, Alina. Thank you for this. Well, before going to the third round, or, or to more military issues, I would like to just remind to, to, to our audience that if you would like to ask a question, there is a kind of function at the bottom of Zoom window. Please put it there and please specify also who, uh, to whom you are asking your question. Uh, in this session round, uh, I would like to start with you, uh, General Hodges. Russia occupies part of Ukraine and Georgia and is militarily active in Syria and Libya and is increasingly active in the Eastern Mediterranean. And Turkey is in the middle uh, of all this. How does Russia put Turkey in the middle of its uh, military strategy? Well, uh, Professor Iden could, could describe the historical uh, aspect of this much better than me, but of course, when Catherine the Great uh, seized Crimea at the end of the 18th century, it was in order, it was done to uh, alleviate one of Russia's traditional strategic vulnerabilities, and that's the lack of access, uh, warm water access to the oceans of the world. And so that's why Catherine seized Crimea then. And it's why, of course, uh, President Putin re-seized it uh, and Ill illegally annexed Crimea, uh, the Crimean Peninsula, here uh, just a few years ago. Uh, the Black Sea uh, is the launching pad for, uh, for Russia, for everything it does in the, uh, in the Middle East, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and in, uh, in North, uh, North Africa, Libya specifically. Uh, the, the ships, the, everything that's used in Syria, for example, 
weapons, troops, equipment, it all comes out of the Black Sea. It's the, it's the launching pad. I, I had a conversation one time with a uh, senior intelligence official from Romania uh, who was describing the Black Sea and how, what it means to uh, Russia. He said, think of the Black Sea as a balcony for the Kremlin from which it looks out over the Caucasus, the Middle East, the Balkans, and beyond. That's, and of course, Turkey sits in the way. It's right in the middle of this view and this, uh, this uh, Tur uh, Syrian Express that uh, people in the region refer to it, that all the ships coming from Russia into Syria has to pass through the Turkish Straits. So therefore, uh, Russia has always sought to try and control at least the Straits, if not uh, Turkey itself. Now, uh, that's also why Turkey needs, needs allies, and that's why the allies need Turkey, because of this competition. And uh, Alina, of course, was correct to say that so many people refer to the, to the Black Sea as a uh, Russian lake. I think that's the aspiration, but it's not the fact yet. The United States Navy and other allies still, within the constraints of Montreux Convention, still operate in the Black Sea. And as I was reminded by a very good Turkish admiral one time, uh, when I was talking about the need for full-time NATO presence in the Black Sea, he said, General, we have full-time NATO presence 365 days of the year, it's the Turkish Navy. So uh, it, it, was an, it was an important uh, reminder to me. Now, Turkey has, has, is the de facto leader of NATO or the executive agent in the, in the uh, Black Sea region for NATO. They've always wanted that. And so, uh, unfortunately, Turkey has tended to push back on NATO um, initiatives to increase headquarters there, to increase uh, capability there. Uh, I would like to see Turkey uh, be more uh, active in the Black Sea region and what more welcoming of a greater uh, NATO presence there as well. But also to compete in the information space. Um, Turkey should be the first to say any ship that goes into a Crimean port is poison and should not be allowed in, in the port of any NATO country coming directly from Crimea in support of Ukraine, the, where the president of Ukraine had said all the ports are closed of Crimea. And so to, for anybody to allow ships to come from a port from Sevastopol, for example, or any other Crimean port to come into their port de facto acknowledges Russian sovereignty over the Crimean Peninsula. Turkey, I think, uh, should be a country to help lead the charge on pushing back on this. Same thing, they should challenge Russia's claims, illegal claims to an economic exclusion zone, exclusive economic zone, and territorial waters around the Crimean Peninsula that are illegal and invalid because of the illegal annexation. This is, Turkey could be very helpful here. Thank you, General Hoches. Uh, Alina, uh, linked to the same, actually, to continue to the same uh, topic here, uh, my question for you will be, well, through the illegal, uh, its illegal annexation of Crimea, investment in the Black Sea Fleet, and uh, A to AD capability it has deployed, as you have already mentioned, Russia has become the dominant naval power in Black Sea. Do you think, are there ways to reverse this uh, without violating the Montreux Treaty? Um, first of all, I do, I, I, I do need to, to, um, to say something about Russian naval power. Russia is not only a naval power in the Black Sea, Russia is also a military power. There is, um, there, there is um, very, very strong, very much Russian arsenal uh, amassed in Crimea, which is, not, which is not naval, it's not ships, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's land. Uh, its landmines and everything else. So we have to take this into consideration as well. We cannot just ignore everything that, has, uh, that Russia has put uh, there in Crimea. Um, and then we haven't talked about it and maybe it will come up, I hope it will come up uh, throughout the questions. Russia is using a lot of other means other than military to dominate the region and to dominate the, 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 uh, the, the Black Sea region. Um, as I said, uh, it's, it's the propaganda, it's the disinformation, it's all of the disruptions that Russia, Russia is, is, is mastering from, uh, uh, from Kremlin. I will not talk about it, but I do hope that the, the, there are going to be questions about it. It's very important. It's, it's an important part of, 
of, um, of, of, um, of what Russia is doing because it's about perception. And I think General Hodges was, at, at, was somehow hinting at, 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 at it, saying that, of course, Black Sea is not a Russian lake, but there are some countries in the region or, or, the, or there are some um, governments in the region, rather, I would say, which perceive uh, Russia, uh, which perceives uh, Black Sea as, as a Russian lake. So it's about perception as well. It's not, all, not only about reality. And Russia knows how to play it. Coming back to your question, though, which is, which is, uh, navy, it's, 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 it's very naval. Well, there are a few ways around it. Uh, some of them are ideal. They won't happen. Some of them are, are more, more practical. Uh, but first, I, need, I, I, I think we need to keep in mind that there is a strong NATO presence uh, in, in, um, uh, in the Black Sea. Uh, there are military exercises which are being held in the Black Sea, NATO military exercises, joint exercises which are, which are being, being held in, uh, in the Black Sea. So NATO is doing its best to project its naval power in, in, uh, uh, in the Black Sea. What else could be done and how could the Montreal Convention be bypassed? Because I don't think it will ever be, uh, be changed. First of all, um, NATO and the US could help partner countries uh, strengthen their own fleet could help member, NATO member countries, NATO partner countries to increase and to strengthen their own fleet. This way, the permanent naval presence in uh, NATO presence in, in, the, in the Black Sea would increase even, um, uh, even more. Of course, ideally, with Georgia and Ukraine becoming NATO members, this would, would be an even stronger uh, uh, naval presence in, uh, in the region. Um, Another way around it, another way around the Montreal Convention, but that would place an even higher role uh, or even uh, would give uh, an even, uh, even more power to Turkey is the uh, newly projected uh, Istanbul Channel. That is around, that would be a way around the Montreal Convention, but I'm not sure this is a path that NATO would be very uh, uh, willing to choose as, as, uh, as increasing its naval, uh, its naval presence in, uh, in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Uh, Professor Aydan, I would like to continue uh, with you here. In, in the recent battle in Idlib, Turkey suffered considerable losses thanks to Russian support to the Syrian regime. And Turkey, uh, it was reported, inflicted, inflicted uh, heavy losses on the Syrian regime, destroying lots of Russian-made equipment in the process. So can Turkey and Russia really move beyond this? Could you please add me? Thanks. Um, let, let me just say a few words about the Black Sea also, because yeah, sure. dear, dear to me, Black Sea is here. Uh, General Hodges actually uh, indicated very rightly that there is this uh, a connection uh, between Black Sea and the Russian presence in the Eastern Mediterranean. Without the Crimea and the bases there, the Russian Black Sea fleet would not have been able to uh, support logistically uh, what it has been doing in Syria. So on my mind, at least, this whole theater of operation from Black Sea to the Levant is just one theater of operation. So we have to look at it uh, all together. And this is something I think is missing in Turkish foreign policy making and Turkish security analysis. Uh, up until Crimea, 2014, well, 2012, just before the Crimea, actually, uh, Turkey was the biggest uh, uh, naval force in the Black Sea. But after taking over Crimea and also uh, 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 getting about 70% of what was left of former Soviet uh, uh, Black Sea fleet on Ukraine uh, uh, right, and then investing on it, Russian Black Sea fleet now became the biggest naval force in the Black Sea. And as uh, Alina already indicated, they supported that force with land-based missiles uh, and created a very strong A2, uh, A2 AD zone in the Black Sea. And link this zone with another A2, A2 AD zone on the uh, 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 northeast of Turkey, on the, on the Armenian border. There are Russian missiles and ex ex exactly the same zone. And also, uh, they have been able to create the same zone in Syria, uh, where uh, around Tartus and uh, and their uh, other uh, other zones that they control. So now they are able to control this no-go zone in a sense uh, uh, in three three sides of Turkey. And this is for the first time in history that Turkey is surrounded in a sense 
uh, by the Russian presence. Uh, it's on the north, it's on the northeast, and it's on the south. Uh, and that has never happened before. And I think, personally, I believe that Turkish decision-making process has not really uh, uh, go through the strategic implications of this uh, three-sided uh, three presence. So Idlib, um, obviously the two countries has, in a sense, moved beyond Idlib. Uh, and they signed a latest uh, agreement. But this has become a kind of very familiar uh, behavior in Syria, and as, especially in Italy. Uh, from my perspective, I understand that Italy is eventually going to be part of the area controlled by the Syrian regime. But this is not going to be in a one-step move. It, it is like a salami uh, move. Uh, they build up their, uh, their, their forces, they move, Turkey opposed, uh, there is some uh, uh, clashes, uh, then there is an agreement, we give up a territory. Then we have an, uh, you know, three, four months or, uh, of peace, then the next, uh, next attempt start. So in it, Idlib is not going to be totally stabilized, that's obvious, but also Idlib is not an uh, existential threat either for Turkey or for, uh, for Russia. So it's not a, it's a tactical area for both countries. It's not strategic uh, for both countries. For Turkey, the, uh, the zone uh, just beyond the Turkish border on the north was a strategic area because it linked to the Kurdish uh, uh, desires and etc. Idlib is not such a zone. So it's not a strategic, it's not an existential uh, threat either for Turkey or Russia. So they can always, uh, in a sense, move beyond their competition there, and which they have so far able to do. Uh, the, the real problems, of course, from the Turkish perspective, is that Turkey still needs Russia in Syrian theater vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, east of Euphrates. The cooperation there is quite important to balance out other actors. Uh, also, Turkey controlled zone in the northern Syria, where the potential is that if uh, Idlib is settled, then the next uh, question might be the Turkish controlled zone or Syrian National Army controlled zone. A and finally, of course, the future of endgame and the future of Syria, where Turkey needs Russia uh, to play with. Uh, so for Turkey, uh, uh, Russia is more important, I think, than Italy. And they try to, and the decision makers in Turkey, understanding this, are trying very hard to ignore, within quotation marks, what Russia is really doing. Uh, you know, when there is a, a downing of Turkish, um, uh, when there is a bombing of Turkish troops, um, most of the indications show that this is either Russian or by Russian allowed to do it, but the Turkish government chooses to ignore that and blames the Syria and tries to give the message to Russia over Syrian forces. Uh, so I think the both countries do understand the, the balance and so far the value of them to each other is more important than totally breaking up the relationship. So they have moved beyond the Idlib, but they couldn't, uh, I think, forget Idlib. It will come back in more, more or less five months from now. Thank you, Professor Adam. Uh, before going on, uh, going open up, open up, uh, opening up for the questions, uh, I am sure there will be a question about the S four hundred issue. So, uh, could you explain why did Turkey buy S four hundred system from Russia, and why did Turkey delay the activation, which was supposed to take place in April? Do you think there is a link with the uh, last crisis in uh, Italy? Uh, you are asking me, right? Yeah. Um, I think the, the reasoning to buy, uh, decision to buy S-400 was quite complex. Uh, I don't think that only one reason could explain it. Uh, there is this, uh, what I would call factual explanation, which is that Turkey does need this air defense system, and it has been trying to buy this system from different countries, especially the foremost from the United States, but couldn't do it. So in that sense, this was a necessary decision to buy it. Uh, but there is also a political explanation, I think. Uh, Turkey, at least for me, Turkey had uh, needed to compensate Russia for its cooperation in Syria 
uh, and also for its uh, uh, cooperation on the energy issues, you know, building this uh, nuclear power plant. And I think this was a very good way of uh, kind of responding the gesture. And the third explanation I can find is a kind of a diplomatic bureaucratic explanation uh, that uh, sometimes we hear that the United States did not uh, convey its, uh, its objections early on the process or where they were not really able to do it, how much they objected to the process. So it gave kind of an impression to the decision makers in Turkey that it might be okay to go ahead with it. Uh, uh, I don't know how much this played a, a role. And the final explanation I would say is a kind of a psychological explanation. Uh, it has to do with uh, what happened uh, on the night of coup attempt. Uh, you know, the, the uh, F-16 airplanes, which are Turkish airplanes, but also NATO uh, connected airplanes, bombing different sites in Turkey and the government was not able to bring them down. So shooting them in the next time they are going to try uh, such an attempt might be uh, a, a way of going forward. You know, S-400s could be used for that. But of course, nobody will, will talk about this. Uh, why Turkey did not yet, well, delay the activity, activation? Again, the factual uh, uh, reason is coronavirus. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's created havoc everywhere, and it's also in Turkey and in Russia. Uh, I don't think simply it's because simply that they are not ready to be activated at the moment. That's the factual explanation. But of course, there is always a background of this kind of uh, explanations. Uh, economically, activating them now, of course, would mean the activation of United States sanctions on Turkey, which would be devastating at the moment when Turkey's economy is going very, in a very difficult patch. Uh, and of course, diplomatically, there is a message here, and everybody is trying to read that message, uh, that we are delaying this, so uh, why don't you, United States, become more friendly to us, so we might do something else. So this is kind of a diplomatic message, and I can, uh, I think this is, these are kind of three reasons that I can find out. Thank you, Professor Adam. General Hodges, what, what are the implications of Turkey's activation of S-400? Is there still a way out of this, do you think? Well, um, for sure, I hope that there's a way out. I mean, I, I don't excuse uh, this bad decision uh, by Turkey to purchase us for 100. Um, there's nothing good that's going to come out of it. I, Professor Iden laid out a good, good, plausible explanations for why the decision was taken. Um, I, but that doesn't mean that they're, it's a good decision. And for sure, there's no way that uh, if Turkey moves ahead, uh, that they will be able to be part of the F-35 community. And this is not just about having an airplane. Turkey had a critical role in the, in the production, in the, in the supply chain. So this is gonna have a, a neg this will have a negative impact on Turkish economy. But um, the, uh, the, the trust between Turkey and the United States has been so damaged for a variety of reasons by actions on both sides. Uh, and th this this has got to be repaired. Um, I hope that the uh, the United States will find a way that uh, for President Erdogan to be able to walk back from this decision in a way that is uh, uh, done by friends, uh, longtime friends, Turkey and the United States, uh, that, but uh, that allows where the United States doesn't have to look like it won but instead we get back to a, a good, strong relationship between, between two allies and two old friends. Um, the, uh, but Turkey, Turkey has to want this uh, as well. Um, I, I, can't, I can't think of a good reason why Turkey would do this. There, there is this fairy tale out there that Turkey wanted to buy Patriot, but the United States would not sell it. And that's just not true. I was in Izmir from 2012 to 2014 as the commander of NATO's land command. The United States desperately wanted to sell Patriot uh, to Turkey, um, but we were not willing to give all the technological uh, information, the technical data that Turkey wanted so that Turkey could make it itself. We don't share that same data with Germany or Netherlands or Spain or other nations that have Patriot system either. This is a normal process. 
So to say that the United States would not sell Patriot Turkey is not true. And unfortunately, even my own president echoed that, that this uh, in, inaccurate uh, statement. Uh, at the same time, we had American, German, and Dutch Patriot units in Turkey protecting Turkish population citizens from Russian-made missiles coming out of Syria. So the, the irony of, the, of, the, of this relationship and this situation um, is something that needs to be clarified and addressed as well. Bottom line, I hope that we find a way out of it. This relationship is too important. Thank you. Thank you, General Lurgis. Alina, would you, would you like to add something on that or, or something on other issues? Or if you don't have anything to add, I will move to the, to the Q&A and get the questions from audience. So now I would like to turn to my colleague, uh, Ceylan Canbilek in Ankara, who kindly offered to uh, help us for this part of agenda. So Ceylan, over to you. Thank you, Kadri. Happy to help with the questions. And the first two are familiar, uh, similar to each other. So I will just uh, combine them. The first one is from Haldun Solmaz Turk. Bearing in mind the institutionalization of Turkish national security decision making and the ultimate decision unit being single dominant individual, how far is it to talk about Turkish policy rather than President Erdogan's policy, particularly in the context of Russia? And another one on uh, foreign policy and leadership. This is from Herbert Regenbogen. Is the president of Turkey, Erdogan, a spoiler in which Turkish foreign policy is gouged to portray themselves as a victim? I believe these can be directed to Professor Aydın. Thank you, Jelan. Okay, difficult questions. Well, um, the second question is easier, of course. Yes, uh, especially President Erdogan uh, likes to present himself and his country always as a victim. Uh, you know that's a, that's his uh, a political tactic in domestic politics, and I think his, it has become uh, uh, in recent years a, a political tactic in international uh, relations as well. Um, for the first question is also, I mean, um, a person who is ruling a country in last 17 years, making a decision in in whatever way he makes a decision, doesn't make a difference. It's a policy of Turkey you know, for the analytical purposes. Um, when we are talking and when we are writing, we might say it's the decision of the government of Turkey, but in practice, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, in, especially in international relations, uh, people don't see the difference. Uh, you know, they, they react what Turkey does. However, Turkey reached that decision, uh, it doesn't matter for the other countries. So by that token, we can say that all the decision making in, in Russia is concentrated on Putin. So it's the Putin's foreign policy, but it doesn't make any difference. It's Russia eventually that puts all its effort behind Putin's decision making. And it's the same in Turkey also. General Lurgis, would you like to answer, I believe? Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, make one comment on Professor Iden's uh, excellent analysis. Um, I was told by a, uh, on a recent visit to Ankara, a former Turkish officer uh, told me, he said, General, just keep in mind the decision to purchase um, uh, the S-400 was not an institutional decision. And of course, what he was talking about is, goes to the heart of this, that the uh, Turkish acquisition process goes directly up to the head of state not through the Ministry of Defense, which is the more common procedure. And so um, I think it, it does matter uh, that, we, that we make that distinction because uh, Turkey USA or Turkey NATO 2.0 has got to look, we have to think strategically into the future. If we make, if, if the West, if the United States makes decisions because we're unhappy with something that perhaps President Erdogan did or the President of any country based solely on that, then it causes us to think short term and not strategically. And so uh, we, thinking strategically, we clearly want to have a relationship 
uh, with uh, our Turkish allies that's important and sustainable way into the future. And so being able to separate these certain decisions, I, I think, does matter. Go ahead, Alina. Now, I just want to add something because this is a question which could be very well uh, asked for, uh, for, for other countries as well, it's not, only, not only for Turkey and not only for Russia. And I think the real question, and probably that's what is behind the question, is once the current leader, once the current president um, ends uh, his, his tenure, his mandate, gets out of power one way or another, how easily, how quickly um, will the other institutions, will the system um, shift the strategy, shift the policy? So if President Erdogan, President Putin, or President Trump for that matter, take a decision which is based solely on their own personal um, thinking, it's a bad decision, it's a bad strategy, how quickly, one, once they're not in power anymore, will the entire system of the respective country and the institutions will be able to change uh, to reverse even the respective strategy and the respective decisions. I think this is the, the, the question that we all have to ask at the end. Okay. Jaylan, you can go ahead. So the next question is from Daphne McCurdy. Does Turkey have any leverage over Russia or is it the relationship one-sided? And specifically on Syria, what value does Turkey provide to Russia? Well, this it's not specified. Uh, who should, would like to answer this question? Open to all panelists. I mean, please. I can start if <laughs> go ahead. Throw the towel. Um, well, what value Turkey provides to Russia? The simplest answer is that uh, ability to divide NATO. Uh, that's the best value that Turkey could give to Russia. Russia is able to meddle. Uh, instill a, a difference within NATO ranks. That's, that's I think, the most important benefit uh, of this, uh, uh, this relationship. But apart from that, you know, don't, let's not think Russia as an all-powerful country. Right? Uh, I mean, in Syria, they are in a very big trouble. Uh, right? they, they have spent so much money that they cannot afford, really. Uh, and, and Putin is and Russia is very, uh, I think uh, they, they wish to finish up uh, uh, Syria as soon as possible. Uh, and, and also Turkey provides there uh, to kind of a counter balance to the United States in, in different theaters uh, of, uh, of Syria. So uh, in a sense, there is a value, but whether Turkey has a leverage, that's something else. Uh, overall, I don't think Turkey has much leverage uh, towards Russia. We have seen this uh, in uh, 2015, when Turkey decided to uh, put down a Russian airplane. Uh, and within overnight, the Russian reaction was to block everything. Right? There was no leverage there. Everything was blocked totally, and the policy was totally reversed. Uh, so that shows the different type of Russian decision making when it matters to them uh, to show a reaction. Uh, they can just disregard every kind of a connection. Uh, but recently in Italy, that was a different story. You know, the, when Turkey kind of differentiated between Russia and its allies in Syria, uh, uh, Syrian regime, Russia showed very clearly that they don't care about their allies. You know, if you don't attack Russia directly, then you have some sort of a leverage. I'll, I'll stop here. Okay. Go ahead, General. You should add me up, please. Um, I was just going to say, um, in terms of what value is, is Turkey to Russia, um, Professor Aydin, of course, um, hit on a, a critical part of it. I, I would say Turkish inaction uh, or lack of, of firm uh, response in the Black Sea helps the Kremlin uh, uh, with its desire to make the Black Sea a, a Russian lake. Um, Turkey is a, is a respected economic, military, diplomatic country. It's a large country. It could be doing so much more in the Black Sea region to help 
um, uh, push back on, on Russia's desire to dominate uh, the, the entire region. Georgia, uh, Turkey's neighbor, uh, has long wanted to establish a seaport in Anaklia, so that uh, a deep water port that would enable uh, traffic from Eurasia to move to Europe. Georgia could become the logistics hub between Eurasia and Europe. It would completely change the economic dynamics of the Black Sea region. Turkey would benefit, Romania would benefit, Ukraine would benefit. Only Russia would not benefit. Uh, European countries like Germany, the Netherlands, they would invest in Georgia, uh, this logistics hub, uh, and then they would take an interest in the security of Georgia. And, and of course, they'd be very interested in freedom of navigation and uh, legal uh, economic, exclusive economic zones and territorial waters, which is exactly why Russia has pushed back and did everything it could to make sure that this port never got underway in Georgia. Turkey has done nothing, has said very little about this. They, they could be much more um, helpful in the diplomatic space and in the information space. Now, I am pleased that Turkey and Ukraine seem to be working more closely together uh, in terms of uh, sharing technology, uh, exercising together, training together. I think this, this is a, an important development that needs to, uh, needs to continue. I think we can go to the next question. Yeah. Well, the next one is from Alex Lowe, and it's specifically on Bulgaria, and it's open to all panelists. Any signs of geopolitical Turkey-Russia competition in Bulgaria today? Go ahead, General. Go on to answer. Uh, I, I don't see, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a specific uh, thing there. Of course, Russia's uh, attempts or influence inside Bulgaria is still strong, but also Turkish influence inside Bulgaria is still strong, particularly on the, uh, uh, the eastern uh, corner uh, of Bulgaria there. Um, so uh, it, it would not surprise me that, that the various influences would, uh, would bang into each other, but I don't have a specific uh, example that I could answer with. Thank you. Alina? Um, yes, indeed, the Russian influence is very, very strong in Bulgaria, and Turkey has its own, its own interests, especially when it comes to the Turkish minority. But when you look at a country like Bulgaria, and there are other countries in the region with this specific, which is a corrupt country with a, with a corrupt, with a very, very corrupt government, um, there are many geopolitical actors at play, but the most important one becomes the corruption itself and the corrupt government. So while Russia does continue to have a strong influence, much stronger than, than, than Turkey, if, if you ask me, I think that the, the, the main geopolitical um, um, uh, interest and actor there, it's, 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 the, it's the corruption and the, uh, the bad governance. And as I said, it's not only Bulgaria, it's other countries in the region where the same uh, sort of analysis uh, can, can apply. We look at them at geopolitical, uh, like at, as fields of geopolitical competition between one country or another, when in fact, the, the real interest which is there and the real uh, the real actor out, out there are their own uh, their own uh, uh, bad government. Thank you, Professor Adam. Would you like to add something on that or? Well, I mean, there is a, a I would say trilateral moves in the Balkans as a whole. Uh, European Union, Turkey, and Russia. They uh, always moving among the same circles and trying to increase their influence. But I wouldn't really characterize that as a competition. You know, it, when, when, I, when I hear competition, I imagine what Turkey and Russia had in the Black Sea, in the Caucasus and in Central Asia during the 1990s. You know, it was very intense and very clear competition with different aspects, you know, economic, politics, security, social, and everything. Uh, in the Balkans, we don't see that kind of an intensity of competition. I don't think Turkey is a big, in that sense, a, that big player in Bulgaria, especially when you contrast it with Russian position in Bulgaria. So the next one is uh, exactly on Central Asia and geopolitical considerations. It's from Lars Alexander Muchov. 
which role plays Central Asia in the competing geopolitical considerations of Turkey and Russia, and how is the struggle likely going to play out vis-a-vis -vis the ever-growing influence of China in that region? No specific panels. I want to answer this question. Go ahead, General. Uh, let me um, address just one aspect of it, and it is this east-west uh, economic uh, corridor that I alluded to a little bit earlier, that um, the last thing that the Kremlin wants is for Georgia to become a logistics hub between Central Asia and, um, and Europe. Uh, already in the month of April, the um, number of trains from China that ended up in Duisburg, Duisport in Germany, which is the terminus of the Silk Road, if you will, uh, the new Silk Road is at a record level. So after February and March being low due to the virus, April is already back up at normal levels and beyond. So this, this uh, east-west traffic is important. If the port of Anaclia uh, comes into being, then you could shave off even more days of the amount of time it takes to move containers from Shanghai all the way to Duisburg. It would uh, significantly change the economic uh, dimensions of the Black Sea region. Everybody there benefits except for the Kremlin, of course. Uh, they don't want the competition and they don't want European countries being interested in security and stability in Georgia, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, or Turkey. So this is where part of the competition comes from. And as always, if the West does not step forward, the Chinese will always step in and fill that vacuum. They're already um, taken over uh, so much of the uh, transportation infrastructure in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and if, if the West does not compete here, eventually the Chinese are going to do it, and then we're going to be regretting it. Alina? Um, I don't see it as a competition either, because the interests are different. Russia needs Central Asia uh, to remain in its political sphere of influence. It has traditionally been there, and it's very important for, for the Russian domestic uh, uh, audience, for the Russian population to continue to perceive to perceive this as such. Uh, Russia also, Kremlin, also needs uh, Central Asia for its Eurasian Union, which is another construct for domestic consumption, which, which Putin uses from time to time whenever he needs to show that he is very, very, very strong and, and very mighty. So I don't think Russia has a very strong economic interest in Central Asia, but rather a political uh, interest, while China has a very strong economic interest. So. I don't see the competition because the interests are, are, are different. But I do agree with General Hodges that the European Union and the West in general should be much, much worried about, uh, much more worried about what China is doing in Central Asia and throughout Europe for that matter. Mustafa Bey, are you adding something or shall I go on with the next? Yeah, question? just go on. Yeah. Okay, and this one is for you. <laughs> and you already touched upon the naval presence in Black Sea, but this is specific to NATO. Do you think uh, it's from Haldun Solmaster? Do you think the Turkish military is too willing to increase NATO naval presence presence in Black Sea? Well, when you put the, when you put the question as too willing, uh, the answer is easy. It's not too willing to have more NATO presence in the Black Sea. It never had. Uh, the Rush Turkey's position in the Black Sea, I think, has always been to preserving the equilibrium it was created at the end of the Cold War, where Turkey was slightly uh, a, a better or higher power in the, in the Black Sea as, an, as, as far as naval forces are concerned, and supported by NATO from outside. Uh, and the Turkish pre preference was uh, not to corner Russia too much by the uh, too many NATO or Western uh, presence in the Black Sea and the Caucasus. And when you talk to the Turkish officials, uh, they, they would indicate to Georgia 2008 and Ukraine 2014 as kind of uh, Russian reactions for uh, too much Western presence in the region. Whether this is a, a, a right reading of the situation, it doesn't matter, but that's the kind of a perception 
uh, from Turkish higher ups in decision making. So I don't see, I don't think that Turkey would like to have more NATO powers uh, in the Black Sea. But occasionally, uh, you know, one hears when Turkey and Russian interest clashes in Syria, then you see Turkish president going to Ukraine and starting to talking about why NATO is not being more in, in the Black Sea. Uh, I think these are just a, a kind of a, 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 a play for the games, play, play for the time, uh, but not real Turkish uh, position. If no other comments on this one, I'm moving to the next one. And this is for Alina and Mustafa Bey, and it's from Stephen Flanagan. How have Turkey and Russia managed to keep differing political and military policies in the Black Sea region from damaging their cooperation in Syria and on energy and economic issues? For example, Russia didn't seem to react harshly to President Erdogan's February meeting with President Zelensky, where he criticized Russian operations in Idlib and announced a 30, 33 million assistance package to Kiev for the transfer of Turkish military equipment to the Ukrainian army. At the same time, Turkey has continued to support Ukrainian and Georgian aspirations to join NATO. Alina. Up. Um, I think that the, the, first, the first key to, to a good cooperation, which is, it's too much said good cooperation, but not going at each other's throat, um, in the Black Sea between Turkey and Russia is because, as I said before, Turkey has very much retreated politically from, from the Black Sea region. Um, it is not the same uh, important actor, major actor that it used to be, that it wanted to be. It's very much consumed that it should be with, with its southern border. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, project the image of a real competitor, of a real opponent, even. To, to Russia's interest in, uh, 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 in, the re in the region. I think that is why President Putin doesn't pay too much attention to the um, um, dance that Turkey is now doing uh, uh, with Ukraine. He probably will if it gets more serious, but on the other hand, um, he pretty much got what he wanted with Crimea. So he feels like his position when it comes to, maybe he will get even more in Eastern, in Eastern Ukraine. So he feels like his position there is not threatened by, by, uh, by, um, by what Turkey and by the dialogue between, uh, between, Turkey, uh, between Turkey and Ukraine. Um, yeah, I agree with Alina and unfortunately, uh, Turkey is focused has really moved on uh, from Black Sea to, uh, to the detriment of all the other regions also uh, focusing too much on the Middle East. Uh, and in the Middle East is too much focusing on Syria and kind of uh, ignoring the other regions. And Turkey is not certainly not as active as it was in the Black Sea 10 years ago or even before. Uh, and also uh, the February was interesting. I think the, in the, uh, that was the aftermath of attacks on Turkish soldiers uh, in Syria. And Putin and Russia understands that Turkey sometimes needs to show its reaction. And they allowed Turkey to show its frustration in Syria. And Turkey did a number of uh, this kind of pushbacks in different theaters, not only in Ukraine, but also in Georgia, in Syria, and in Libya, in, uh, everywhere, and become very critical of Russia overnight. But that continued only a couple of days. And after which there was also at the same time, actually signals to Russia, let's start talking, you know, not putting blame direct, directly on Russia. Uh, that's, that was a kind of a game that Russia did understand that Turkey, Turkey needed, uh, needed to do it. And regarding uh, supporting Georgia and Ukraine uh, for, uh, for NATO uh, membership, that was the Turkish position. Uh, all along, from the very beginning, uh, this is not new and there is nothing new. So Russia does know that and it doesn't ask, uh, do not ask from Turkey to change it at all. Uh, because presumably Russia also realized that it's not the Turkish decision uh, that makes the influence to, to make the, uh, these two countries member of NATO. Um, so it's it hardly uh, worth it to pressure Turkey to change its position on these two countries. And finally, uh, this Turkey and Russia, uh, the magical word is kind of became, uh, is, is the compartmentalization. 
you know, they seem to be able to compartmentalize their relationship until a position that then where everything collapses suddenly. Yeah. <laughs> until that moment, it seems that they can divide the relationship in different theaters uh, and trying to not affect the relationship, what happening in one theater, uh, in another theater, or in one area, in another area. Thank you. And the next one is again from Harun Solmastrik, and it's a follow-up question on S400s. Isn't the S400 decision a sign of fundamental problem of communication between Turkey and NATO slash USA? And I believe either General Hodges and Mustafa Bey can pick this up. General. Thank you, Professor. Um, I wish I had the view that you have behind you, by the way. Uh, absolutely beautiful. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, as we uh, said earlier, uh, of course, this was a, um, a problem of communication between Turkey and the United States to some extent, but it's more a reflection uh, of the fact that we don't have a strategy that looks um, in a, in a clear, sustainable, long-term way about the important role that Turkey has in the greater Black Sea region, both as part of NATO, but also as an ally to the United States. Um, and so we end up kind of bouncing from issue to issue to issue uh, because it, it's not grounded into an overall strategic framework. Uh, the fact that the boundary between U.S. European Command and U.S. Central Command is also the border between Turkey and Syria is to me the manifestation of the, the framework needing to be uh, a significant uh, upgrade so that we, we make smart decisions and, and look at Turkey uh, and it's in the role, the critical role it plays in the region to help contain Iran, deter Russia, provide stability, help provide stability in the Balkans. Um, and it, it, if you change the map for how you look at the map, it changes how you think about things. And so this S-400 decision, um, the, the mistake that the United States made in uh, partnering with YPG to fight against ISIS, um, that was tactical benefit, strategic mistake, and we're gonna be paying the price for that for a long time. As the professor said, Turkey has a very long memory as, do, uh, as does Russia. Uh, and, and I think we made a mistake there uh, by doing that. So um, reestablishing trust. Um, you know, after the attempted coup, um, the United States should have been the first country on the planet to immediately um, say that this was wrong, that any attempt to overthrow a democratically elected government is unacceptable, especially when it's a, uh, an ally. So several things that the United States has done wrong. At the same time, a, relation a relationship takes two. And Turkey has to want to uh, save this relationship. Turkey has to um, value the relationship and always being the victim, always blaming the United States or the West or Europe for its problems um, is not helpful either. Mustafa Bey? Um, I think Gen General Hedges uh, made very good points and I just agree with them and just add, uh, we hear this argument sometime from the Turkish uh, decision makers or people close to the decision makers that, uh, that they didn't get the US reaction early on or uh, they didn't get it enough. Uh, and also sometimes uh, I hear the same argument from some of the American uh, analysts, uh, they are making the same case that the U.S. has to, had to make uh, its case more well known to, to Turkey and early on. But personally, I don't think so. I mean, you know, I got the message from the first minute that S-400, uh, not be much before the decision, when uh, people started talking about S-400, I learned about the American opposition to it and the reasons, and they were very clear. Um, so as an academic, if I know it, I'm sure some of the decision makers at least knew it and a diplomat certainly knew it. So I, I wouldn't personally agree that there was, uh, uh, the message was not really uh, given enough, but we occasionally hear this argument, especially from Turkey's side, but sometimes 
from the American side too. Thank you. The next one is from Galip Dalay. Given the recent developments in Libya, in which Turkey-backed DNA is gaining ground with the Haftar forces, which is Russia-backed, what scenarios do you anticipate to play out between Russia and Turkey in Libya, new cooperative framework or more conflictual phase? And he ends with a personal note that he doesn't make any discrimination, discrimination against any speaker, so it's open for all. <laughs> Who would like to start uh, to answer this question? Well, let me take a, a stab at a piece of it. Um, I, I just looked at a picture uh, recently of a uh, of destruction of one of General Hafter's air aircraft sitting on the ground uh, on fire um, after it was struck by a Turkish uh, unmanned aerial system. Um, I think where we're where we're headed is. Um, the uh, I think the European Union is going to make a decision to uh, put boots on the ground in Libya. Um, that they they are looking at potentially hundreds of thousands of refugees coming across the Mediterranean uh, into Europe, and of course Italy will be the first place that they come to. Um, I think that uh, the the European Union is is looking for um, at, at looking at its options to to help bring an end to the conflict there uh, in Libya. I, I don't know this for a fact, obviously, uh, and they would have to have some sort of a mandate, but Italy specifically has been uh, anticipating for the last uh, three or four years, the, the potential for having to put troops there as part of some kind of uh, peacekeeping force or peace implementation force or something uh, because uh, that, they, they can't take more refugees into Italy. So I, I think um, I think we're heading to something like that uh, here within the next year. Professor Aydin? Um, well, I, I, I'm not an expert on Libya, but uh, if you are looking at um, Turkish-Russian relationship there, I think we will see both cooperative framework and also conflicting um, relationship, just like in Syria. You know, we both cooperate and conflict in Syria, and it will be continuing the same thing in, in Libya. The difference between Syria and Libya is that uh, for Russia, Libya is not Syria. You know, there are Russian boots on the ground in Syria. They have invested, invested a lot. Uh, so far in Libya, it's Wagner Group. Uh, it's, it's very circumstantial. Uh, it's not directly the Russian presence there. So the Russian position might really uh, determine the relationship between Turkey and Russia over Libya, because Turkish position is much openly declared in Libya, uh, and we are there already. So Turkey cannot really change its position, but Russia uh, still able to change it. So it might depend on Russia. And also, Turkey has shown uh, its, uh, its uh, willingness and actually its wish to have a cooperative framework with Russia uh, when we had this, uh, this meeting in Moscow trying to bring to broker a ceasefire between all the countries and also trying to bring everything, uh, also Russia to uh, the Berlin uh, framework. Uh, so Turkey prefers obviously to have, to create a cert some sort of a understanding at least with Russia similar to Syria in Libya it hasn't happened so far, but as I said, Libya is not that important to Russia. So Turkey might have more leeway in Libya than Syria, but General is right. The, the European position might be important there, uh, but I don't know how Europe is going to play in the post-COVID-19 uh, uh, world, uh, whether it will just you know, deep look uh, inside more and more uh, or be able to play any role it's in its environment. We have to wait and see there. Uh, so I'm moving to the next one. This one is from Lincoln McCurdy, and it's open for all. What's the current status in Russian YPG relations? No, no one knows it. <laughs> I think as always, uh, <laughs> It's, uh, 
I mean, uh, Russia never recognized PKK as terrorist organization, and they never recognized uh, YPG as a terrorist organization. They had connections, both PKK and YPG, uh, throughout uh, the crisis, but they avoided uh, to sending military support to them or military gear to them like the United States is doing. So that's the difference from Turkish perspective, I think. Uh, and Russia is there to pick up the pieces if there is a, a kind of a, a break between US and YPG. If that happens, I'm quite sure uh, Russia would, you know, would be more friendly with the YPG. But we, have, we keep hearing that, of course, they keep the connection. Uh, whenever possibility, they push YPG towards uh, Syrian regime to to uh, to cooperate with the Syrian regime or agree with the Syrian regime. Uh, they always try to broker a kind of a peace between them, but uh, that seems to be the extent of the connection so far. Thank you. So we have one question and a comment. The comment is from Aydin Sezer, and he thanks General Hodges for his clarification on Patriot's sale to Turkey. And the last question is from Galip Dalai to General Hodges. Apart from Turkey, Russia is gaining ground in the Middle East's arm market. In 2017, more than 50% of Russia's arms export went to Middle East, including to many US allies in the Gulf and beyond. To what extent do you think that the US will push back or sanction its allies' military purchase from Russia? If you guys will allow me, I need to address one thing about Montreux that I meant to do it earlier and I, I failed. Um, I absolutely do not believe that we should be trying to get around Montreux. Montreux actually benefits NATO. Uh, there, and Montreux is not a problem for the West. We don't, we don't come even close to halfway filling the potential number of days that we could have US or German or, or Royal Navy ships in the Black Sea region. So the Montreux Convention actually is a good structure, uh, and, and Turkey generally does a good job enforcing it, although I think they could be, Turkey could be more transparent, but generally it's, there is no desire to try and get around it um, from a competition standpoint. To this specific question, there's, there's three parts to it. Um, great power competition, the law, and U.S. domestic politics. Uh, and great power competition, if uh, some of our allies or friends in the Middle East are looking at uh, purchasing uh, Russian equipment, of course, it's the prerogative of every nation to purchase what they want, but there's gonna be consequences for it. I would rather see the United States and Western countries uh, and Turkey compete and offer something better. And Turkey has a wonderful uh, in defense industry, to offer something better so that those countries don't turn to Russia as their source. Now, the law, and this is the real point of the question, you know, the, the U.S. law would require uh, sanctions uh, in, in certain cases. And the president, because, um, and the president will be bound to enforce the law, uh, but depending on uh, pressure from the Congress to hold him accountable for enforcing the law. And then, of course, the fact that we are in a U.S. Uh, presidential election year is going to affect a lot of things. Uh, the administration will not want to be seen as being soft on Russia uh, or easy on Russia uh, because they're open to attack um, from, the, uh, from their political opponents. So I think all of these will uh, impact what happens next. Thank you, General. Alina and Professor Aydin, if you don't have anything to add, we are arriving to the end of our meeting. Jaylan, thank you so much. And well, uh, let me thank all three of you for joining us and making this conversation work. It has been really terrific. Thank you, General. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, Professor Aydin. And let me thank, thank my you. colleague in Ankara, Özgür Unluy Sarşıklı and Ceylan Canbilek. Thanks to my colleague Alberto Talia Pietra in Brussels, who helped to put all of this together. And above all, thanks all of you who have joined us today and thank you and hope to see you soon again. Good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.